This video is going to go over some limit laws that will be used to help us find values of limits easier. Previously, the main way we were finding our limits was by drawing the graph of the function and trying to look at it and determine the y value that we're, we're trying to find. But that's not always very feasible. Some functions are really hard to graph or hard to graph accurately enough to find the y values. And so these rules here are going to help us do that, help us get the answer without drawing the graph. Now this first collection up here, these are not some formulas that you really wanted to memorize. It's just trying to say that if you have a limit with a bunch of things put together, you know, using add, subtract, multiply, divide, and so on, that you're allowed to break it apart into easier pieces. For example, if I had the limit as x goes to zero of the function x squared plus 3x plus 7 times cosine x, you would likely have a pretty hard time trying to draw this graph here. But because I have two different functions being multiplied, I can go ahead and break it apart into two separate easier limits, one that has just the polynomial and one that has the cosine. And then you can try to draw each one separately. The x squared plus 3x plus 7 is going to be a parabola. And I'm not even going to try to worry about exactly what it looks like, but it's going to look something like this here. And if you want to see what is the value when we have 0 here on this parabola, it's going to have a y-intercept of 7. So we're good there. And then secondly, we know what cosine looks like from trig class. And we see if you look at where x is 0, you're going to get 1. So that means that this first limit here, based on that graph, is a 7. And the second limit here is a 1 based on that graph. So we multiply our answers and we get the final answer of 7. So you see, instead of trying to draw this complicated function over here, we can look at two simpler functions and get our answer. And that was really, really useful here. I do want to point out, though, that you can only break apart, only use these, if the limits actually give an answer. And that might not quite make sense right now, but basically if you try to look at one of the graphs and there's no way to get an answer to the problem, then you can't break it apart. And we're actually going to see an example of that at the end of this video. Now the next part here, in fact, I consider it not only the most part, most important part of this video, but also the most important uh, probably rule in this entire chapter. And I call it the Big Limit Theorem. I haven't seen any other books calling it that way. But it's such an important theorem, and it's the way you're going to handle limits by default that I really think it's we need to talk about it and it says is that if your function is a polynomial a rational trigonometric exponential logarithmic or a radical function or a combination of these things and you're able to plug in the number and get an answer then that means that the limit is in fact that answer so the limit we just worked out here if I wanted to, instead of breaking it up, say, well, let's ex skip that whole step. Let's just go ahead and plug in 0 into it. I'd have 0 squared plus 3 times 0 plus 7 times cosine of 0. And I'm going to get the right answer. And this method will work as long as you're any of those types of functions, which is pretty much all the functions we ever deal with, right? I mean, these are the, the ones you see in your, your algebra and trig classes. I will say that there is one category that's not included here that is going to be a commonly seen thing, and that is piecewise. So if you have a piecewise function, then you cannot just plug in the number there. And in fact, because I want to make 
you show me that you understand what's going on, you're going to see piecewise fairly often here because those are the ones that this theorem does not apply to. Other cases where it doesn't apply are if you plug in a number and it's undefined, like you're dividing by zero or something. So in that case, this would not work either. But regardless, if whenever you have any limit ever, this should be your first attempt. Your first try at finding the limit is just plug in the number and see what happens. And it will work a, a good amount of the time. Now this last one here, this thing called the squeeze theorem, This one is actually you know, much less important. We're going to rarely ever use it. But the times that we do use it, it's going to be the only way to find the answer to the problem. Here's an example of that. Let's say I take the limit as x goes to 0 of the function x squared times sine of 1 over x. Now, if you try plugging in 0, you're going to have a problem because you cannot divide by zero, this is undefined. So that means the big limit theorem not going to help us. You also cannot break it up by the first limit rules up there because once again, if you try to look at sine of 1 over x on a graph here, you've probably never done that before and I'll see if I can uh, draw a reasonable graph here. It does something like this. It goes really fast and then it slows out into a regular sine graph. And so if you ask yourself, well, what's my y value right here in the middle? There's really no way to tell. So you cannot find this limit separately, which means we cannot use that property. As I said, if the individual limits don't work, then you cannot split them up. So let me show you now how to do this with the squeeze theorem. And so the squeeze theorem is a really tricky theorem to use. As I said, we're not going to use it that often. But the idea is you need to come up with a function that is bigger than the one you have and one that is smaller than the one you have. The nice thing is that for pretty much every problem that we're going to use the squeeze theorem on, it's going to have either a sine or a cosine in it. And we know from trigonometry that no matter what your x value is, sine is always going to be between negative 1 and positive 1. Has to be. Well, if that's the case here, and I multiply everything through by x squared, and that means negative x squared is less than or equal to x squared sine of 1 over x is less than or equal to positive x squared. And what I'm going to do then is I'm going to call this f of x, the middle one g of x, and this one h of x. And then I can say the limit of the left side, well that I can just plug in 0 and get 0 as the answer. And the limit of the right side, I can plug in 0 and get 0, the answer. And since the right side and the left side both give me the same answer 0, that forces, by the squeeze theorem, that forces that the limit of the middle part also has to be 0. And if you want to see what I mean by squeezing here, if you draw the graph of x squared, it's going to look like this. If you draw the graph of negative x squared, it's going to look like this. And if you draw the graph of x squared sine of 1 over x, it's going to look something like this here. That's a pretty poor graph. but. And the idea is that this graph that we're trying to find the y value of, and we're trying to find it right here at x equal to 0, well, you notice that it's always going to be between these two parabolas, and those two parabolas meet right in the middle, and that means that this red thread, if it's going to always be between them, the only way for it to squeeze in in the middle here is if it has the same y value 
at the top and bottom here. And that's why it's going to have the same y value of 0. With that said, if you're given a problem, I would have squeeze theorem be my last resort to use. I would try everything else before then because it can be very tricky to use here. And it's yeah, just not easy to come up with a way to make this work. And one of the reasons why it's so tricky is because the squeeze theorem, you need three functions in order to do it, but the one they give you in the, in the class is only ever going to be the middle one. It's the one you're trying to find, which means you need to create a bigger and a smaller all on your own that's going to compare well. And a lot of times, that's very, very difficult to come up with them on your own. So like I said, squeeze theorem is pretty useful when it works. Otherwise, just something you kind of ignore.